Hello and welcome to or welcome back to Colonial Outcasts, a channel where we analyze breaking news, establish geopolitical theory, and traditional history through a lens that is generally critical of empire. And what I mean by generally is actually always, because it's bad for us all. Today, we are going to be talking about soft power, how it differs from hard power, why it's important, and why the West is losing it. And we're going to be looking at it in the context of America's and Europe's involvement slash complicity in the Gaza Strip G-side. I'm saying G-side for the next five minutes so that YouTube doesn't limit this post because they they, they play that way. Uh, and the ongoing war of attrition in Ukraine. To that end, we are... joint. Okay, so... We are recording this on a Friday, and I'm sure we're all burnt out. So I'm phoning in the bio of our guest, uh, Dr. Jennifer Cassidy, uh, for the benefit of the audience. And I'm just like copy pasting from the University of Oxford website. So hi, uh, Dr. Jennifer A. Cassidy is a diplomatic scholar at the University of Oxford, where she lectures on diplomacy and international law, digital diplomacy, and gender diplomacy. Her PhD, 2017, from the University of Oxford, focused on the emerging discipline of digital diplomacy, with a specific focus on the changing nature of digital diplomatic signaling and online strategic narratives during times of political crises. I'd say we're definitely in a few of those right now at the moment. So prior to teaching, uh, Jennifer served as a diplomatic attache to Ireland's permanent mission to the United Nations, European External Action Service to the Kingdom of Cambodia and Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Headquarters during the presidency of the Council of the European Union. Uh, she also contributes regularly to media commentary, including the BBC, Sky News, ABC Australia, and the Irish Times. Thanks for carving out some time to hop on our humble little podcast to talk about the shambolic decisions our stalwart Western leaders have been making recently. Thank you. No, it's my absolute pleasure. And I'm so glad we uh, could finally get to chat. I am, this is, uh, sounds great. I'm a big fan of yours. I, I, you know that and the wonderful work that you're doing online and off. So it's like, it's my honor to be here, truly. Uh, oh. Well, thank you so much. Uh, likewise, um, she's also, uh, Dr. Cassidy is also on uh, Instagram, uh, where she makes regular posts about ongoing uh, situations around the world, mostly centering Gaza, mostly. So we'll link her uh, bio yeah. or uh, links in the uh, description. And so, you can just call me, just, just Jennifer is fine. Just Jennifer uh, is fine. You, literally, you can call me any other name, you like uh, Mary, anything, One is, as long as it's not Jenny. Nothing wrong with Jenny, but just I'm like any other name in the world, as long as it's not Jenny. Uh, okay. But Jennifer is perfectly fine. You, you don't have to call me Dr. Cassidy, but thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, again, I'm glad we finally were able to make this work. It's yeah. been like a, like a three month back and forth. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. so. All right, y'all, before um, Jennifer opens up, I'm going to give you a simplified definition of terms. So. Hard power is essentially a coercive approach to international relations, uh, especially one that involves the use of military power. This can also be economic in nature through imposing sanctions and leveraging debt through institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So according to Joseph Nye, he was this American political scientist who started defining these terms, which are now part of uh, academic discourse about mm -hmm. uh, political science. Uh he said that a country may obtain outcomes it wants in world politics because uh, because other countries admiring its values, emulating its example, aspiring to its level of prosperity and openness, want to follow it. And again, we're talking about soft power in this context. In this sense, it is also important to set the agenda and, tr and attract others in world politics and not only to force them to change by threatening military force or economic sanctions. This soft power, getting others to want the outcomes that you want, co-ops people rather than coerces them. So... Um, according to Joseph Nye, in contrast, what we, we see as hard power, which is essentially like might makes right, um, mm -hmm. the ability to use the carrot and stick of economic and military might to make others follow your will. Here, carrots stand for inducements such as reduction in trade barriers, the offer of an alliance, or the promise of military protection. On the other hand, sticks represent threats, including the use of coercive diplomacy, threat of military intervention, or the implementation of economic sanctions. So 
basically, um, soft power is the ability to get people to do what you want them to do in the most reductive terms possible by mm -hmm. not uh, imposing economic sanctions or military force. So it, 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 it's generally preferable from my perspective. Uh, the, the neoconservatives in Washington and the Warhawks would definitely disagree. And we're seeing that play out in real time right now yep. to yeah. the, to the long-term detriment of our geopolitical standing. So um, I, I think you guys may have heard of uh, the city upon a hill in American mm -hmm. political discourse, which is a phrase derived from Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. It was originally applied to the city of Boston by early 17th century Puritans, but it came to adopt a broader use in political rhetoric uh, in U.S. politics, that of a declaration of American exceptionalism and referring to America acting as a quote beacon of hope for the world. So that's our own envisioning of our own soft power, which I don't think really uh, exists <laughs> yeah. anymore. <laughs> so before I get off my exposition horse, I wanted to get your thoughts on a clip from a politician from your neck of the woods, Lord uh, David well, not, Cameron. Not, <laughs> not tech, my working neck of the woods, not okay. my not my the Irish and English distinction. <laughs> my working neck of the woods, but yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. I yeah. mean, I, we, I, we say no more. <laughs> yeah. I, I, w I, w I wouldn't want to claim this guy either. So yeah. Yeah. So here are some remarks um, from his trip to Paraguay. And I wanted to use it as an example to show y'all kind of this soft power speech, like shared values, mul like multilateral trade, you know, are we, we view, foreign policy and economic and geopolitical issues the same way. So we're natural allies. So here's David Cameron from his trip to Paraguay. If you're just listening, I'll narrate what's going on. So what you're hearing is cameras from the photo op. Cameron hails partnership of values with Paraguay. I think the opportunities for partnership are many and great. I think there's a fantastic opportunity for partnership in trade, as you say. Many companies can use Paraguay as a great place to invest and to grow. I think it's also a partnership in values, as we were discussing just now with the President. I think the opportunities to work together on uh, green issues and climate issues and sustainability issues. And I think the opportunity to work together on some of the global issues that we face. We had um, excellent discussions uh, with your president, discussions about the situation in Ukraine, discussions about uh, the crisis in the Middle East, and also the many issues in your neighborhood, in your region, where we can cooperate together. Yes, the situation in Ukraine and the yes. crisis in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. There's, always, there's always no words for him, but... Um... Would you like me to comment on on that? Yeah, I, I just um, I, I just before you open up, I, oh, I just, yeah, yeah, of course. I, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to reiterate um, that countries that kind of share these same values are more likely to uh, work together. So I, I would say that um, now that the U.S. Is, and U.S. hypocrisy is manifest over this Gaza situation, China and Russia are looking like better trade partners. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, please question. go go ahead. Yeah. So uh, you know, in in classic and and uh, I would unfortunately I will say Oxfordian style, uh, the ability the ability to say, you know, everything and yet nothing at the same time, which is uh, um, and actually uh, uh, Rishi Sunak is uh, from Lincoln College, the college in where I did my PhD in, uh, same college as Rachel Maddow actually, mm -hmm. um, but uh, he's our first prime minister, so we're like oh why <laughs> of all the but um re regarding uh johnson if you ask it's not johnson God, if um uh, uh cameron there's so many of them i can't remember being in the in the last while if you actually listen to what he's saying that's a really classic um uh uk strategic narrative he's talking about soft power but actually that's the own uh, he's only framing it in soft power everything is about opportunities um economic uh trade he's still using uh these these hard power um entry points under the framework of soft power so he's really and he's talking about you know green initiatives and and uh, sustainability which that's we can call that nation branding, but at the end of the day, regarding investment, green investment, uh, AI use in, in in climate change, that's still all hard power. That's still all economic might and, and military clout. That's still all 
um, you know, um, the, you know, money, but he's framing it in the in this value sense, uh, because they realize, you know, as, as you rightly said, the US is, uh, it, it's very much been um, exposed the myth of uh, American exceptionalism, uh, you know, across the world, primarily due to social media. And, you uh, the UK, I think, at the moment, uh, within uh, you know uh, the genocide in 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 Gaza, they have gotten away with a lot of of backlash. I, I think they realise that they've gotten away with uh, with a lot regarding their arm, uh, arming of uh, and their and their support for us, and particularly um, you know in in the U, the Ukraine summit that um, peace summit that we just saw. They've avoided a lot of backlash considering what they're actually doing, and also the halting of resolutions in the UN. So um, yeah, they're they're on a quite a, um, a diplomatic mission to kind of promote this soft power um, shared value use but if you actually you know kind of dissect it down it's still very strategic and uh, related to um hard power economic uh, issues right and, and so you mentioned uh, and this is your specialty uh digital diplomacy like how has yeah. so- social media kind of undercut these uh, i would say the the veneer or the the myth of this western altruism where we're just trying to promote uh, promote democracy and human rights and international law throughout the world and kind of make it just a safer, freer place. Uh, like yeah. how, what, what has well, social media's uh, impact been on the West digital diplomacy? Yeah. So, and, and you know, it simply make the world a place at the moment. We're just at the bare minimum saying, can we just make the place a world where people can simply live, like survive? Not even, mm-hmm. we're not even at the place where people we're not, we're asking to live, but, the request is simply survive. Like we're at we're at a base level at a request right now. Um, but regard just to give you know um, uh, your listeners uh, if they're not familiar with digital diplomacy, you know, and and how it came about. It, it, so I did the world's first PhD um, on digital diplomacy, and my case studies, uh, which was finished in two thousand seventeen, but my case studies were actually um, Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea, and also Israel Gaza two thousand fourteen. So you know no two more relevant case studies today um and so what how this concept came about when i was working in the un um general assembly so uh it's an alphabetical order so it goes iran iraq ireland israel so i'm sitting beside israel Um, i'm also sitting beside netanyahu a number of times because there's only three seats per country and i'm the most junior um uh in in the in the embassy and so protocol dictates that the ambassadors must sit at the aisle so we have irish ambassador israeli ambassador then the next the deputies deputies but of course i'm not you know i'm the junior but i'm the junior for ireland but the next in line is the political head so when he was there he would be sitting right beside me so and ireland and israel are this was in 2010 you know where we are we're not we're known to be not that friendly um but at, at that time, you could not use Twitter or Facebook. This is only 2010, 11. You could not use Twitter or Facebook in the hall. It was not allowed at all. Okay. And it was happening outside. And like, you know, people were, use, of course, using outside. And I just thought, okay, there's no way this is not going to come into diplomacy, right? Mm-hmm. We've seen every single technological wave come into diplomacy. One of the famous phrases is, um, in 1851, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Palmerston, when he received his first telegraph, he said, by God, this is the end of diplomacy. That's because he had to reply. He said in his diary, this is because I have to reply within four weeks. He said, how am I going to attend my dinners? How am I going to attend my ambassadorial dinners if I have to reply within four weeks? So I, you know, would they always, these technological ways have always come into, into diplomacy. And so after I spent a number of years in diplomacy, you still couldn't use it in most cases. Um, and when I started digital, uh, my my work on digital diplomacy and strategic narratives in crisis, uh, there had been absolutely nothing written on it. Heads of state still weren't using it. And then the last year of my PhD, Trump came along and just proved my entire political, my entire thesis. So uh, the day before my Viva, he was tweeting North Korea. We think we all remember the rocket man and everyone's like, we're all going to die. And then in our family WhatsApp group, uh, we, my, my 
family aren't in, in politics or diplomacy or anything. Um, but my father said, look, we could all be dead within 24 hours, but we just need to him to keep tweeting for 24 hours and you've got this. Because he was just a walking, breathing thesis on on, on it. But what, how digital... Um, so at the beginning, you thought, okay, it's going to... Uh, I went in thinking, and this 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 point here stands throughout everything to where we are at this moment. I went in thinking, you know, this PhD is the first of its kind. It's going to blow everything out of the water. It's going to be phenomenal. It's going to change diplomacy. No, that's not what happened at all. So what happened is I just, uh, from all the evidence and all the data, and I've been studying this for 15 years and now on AI, with technology and, and politics, we see it. It's, it is an evolution, not a revolution. Okay. And yes, we're seeing the information spread uh, at a quantity and a speed never before seen. People are, are um, receiving the information. We're seeing like the genocide, as we always say, in real time. And yes, this is having impact. Okay. But if, if then if you look at the other side of it, those political institutions, the UN Security Council, you can see the limits of what social media can do. Wonderful. Like there's two discussions there, the, the brilliant benefits that this can bring and actually reducing, bring it back to soft power, reducing the soft power, you know, t- um, pulling the veil. On, on, a na- on a nation state's branding, you know, such as America or American exceptionalism, but to the extent that it can actually change the hard power um, uh, resources of a nation or the actual makeup and resolutions of international institutions, we're yet to see that. It does not hold that power. So, you know, if if that if it did hold the power, we would see we would see this have ended by now. Because I have never seen uh, the, the what we're seeing in in Gaza now. I have never seen the world unite on on social media. And I've been studying political crisis and social media, you know, for uh, 15, 16 years. Um, I've never seen it unite like this. But yes, it's it's changed things, but it hasn't stopped it, right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, not to, not not to put a negative spin on them, and, and that's not uh, um, two things can be true at once. You know, as I said, it can reduce the soft power. It can uh, educate people. The whole world has seen it. It's done wonderful things. It is doing wonderful things, and it is our only resource as the people. I'm not saying do not use it. Look, I'm using it every single day, like every hour. Uh, it is our best tool in this or single best tool is the people in this. Um, and it is doing something, it has changed, it is pressuring politicians, people are changing, but it is not fundamental, it, we don't have that fundamental shift. Um, and hopefully like one day um, we will with, with other technologies. Well, yeah, there. It's it, it's interesting. There, there's a definite a demarcation between like hard and soft power, but they they do intersect and they are intertwined. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I would like to talk about that. It's like yes, of course, we're not going to change like entrenched foreign policy that like a lot of these older politicians who still think they're fighting the Cold War are you know doing. You know, Biden's like we we're gonna like fight with Russia because. That's what we do. <laughs> That's kind of yeah. yeah it, we need a, we need a fight. Like, and I also say with the Cold War, just I'm always saying to my students, well, who was the Cold War Cold for? I'm like, it certainly wasn't Cold for Vietnam. <laughs> Certainly wasn't cold for Korea. Certainly wasn't cold for Cambodia. So that's just sorry a footnote. Oh. Anytime I hear a cold war, I'm just like, it was certainly not a cold. Cold. It was only cold for. <laughs> well, um, yeah. And even for even for U.S. soldiers, it wasn't cold for them. So just the strangest concept to me. I mean, yeah, yeah and the list goes on. Myanmar, Jakarta, yeah. Indonesia. Oh like, yeah, yeah, like oh South, yeah, like the, all of South America. <laughs> yeah, like any containment. Yeah, I like yeah the. The ones that I was uh, picking there, just the ones that I, I had had work had worked on. But yeah, I'm sorry, that was a, a footnote. <laughs> yeah, so they think they're still fighting the Cold War. Uh, they, they still think that the United States has what you'd say the hard power that we had in the '90s, uh, which no longer really exists. I think U.S. staying power is being challenged by the mm. proxy war in Ukraine. Um, yep the escalating situation in the Middle East and now mm. the U S military and political apparatus wants to do a fundamental shift to 
Asia, the Asian Pacific, mm-hmm. and we're seeing a potential flashpoint bl- brewing with China and Taiwan, right, as you yeah. know, they, they keep trying to physically contain China. Uh, yeah. So uh, it, it, it just doesn't seem realistic anymore, this unipolar dominance of, yeah. of the West. Um, but there's a lot of inertia going on behind it. And I wanted to bring it back to like software. It's like, yes, we, uh, the image of America as this shining city on a hill. I mean, a lot of people have questioned yep. that for a long time, but a lot of Americans are now starting to question it because of the yeah, which hypocrisy. Is, yeah. And that's the first, sorry, sorry to interrupt. That's yeah. the first time that, you know, we've really seen this and that's the power of social media, it, it, you know, in a, in, a, in a crisis that we're seeing, um, uh, you know, um, um, so many millions of Americans, if not like hundreds of millions, like, sorry about the, fig- if the figures aren't, you know, correct, but actually questioning it, you know, themselves and actually removing themselves from the government. We saw it, you know, it, 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 in the Vietnam War, bring it back to technology and, and political crises, but the introduction of the TV in people's sitting rooms was actually the core, like one of, if not the direct correlation to the to the protests that we saw on campuses because for the first time people saw on their screens oh hang on this is not the jingoistic war that i was sold like this this is what happens in war they were seeing actual footage footage of what was going on was like oh hang on this is not what we were sold regarding a war and so they uh, so there's a lot of study done about actually the introduction of the television into American sitting rooms is one of the key reasons uh, for the anti-Vietnam War protests. Yeah, and also seeing footage of the National Guard smoke for students at Kent State in 1968 yeah. didn't help either. Exactly. Like, wait, yeah, our, you know, our own government is willing to do this to us over a illegal war. Huh, that's problematic. So yeah. uh, the uh, the Vietnam corollary is also interesting because that kind of high lit um, and, and emphasized. U.S. foreign policy hypocrisy, where the communists were the ones supposed supposedly doing this, it's like, well, they may be somewhere, but like we're doing it way more. Also, um, how it also exposed the influence of the military-industrial complex mm-hmm. on our government. And so, and what what I talk about when I talk about like this pro-Palestine movement and you know pushing for a ceasefire in a uh, a Palestinian state, like Vietnam. That was like 10 years of activism and direct action. It took 10 years because like soft power was degraded for a long time, but it took a long time for that to yeah. shift foreign policy. So I, exactly. I wanted to ask you about like, what are the consequences of losing like soft power, both at home and abroad? And does it eventually affect how we do hard power? Policy? So the, yeah, so no, a great question. And, and you know, jo- Joseph Nye's, um, concept of uh you know soft power and um he's an oxfordian himself so we we, would have some good people i actually (laughs) not 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 to name drop but i do meet him do meet him once a year uh because he's well a lot of americans are have links to ireland and Mm -hmm. when i met him once this is i know a little off topic but i think it might be just somewhat of amusing i went up to him and i didn't want to seem like it's I couldn't just say, oh, we're just two diplomatic scholars hanging out. Like, no, you're Joseph Nye, and I am, like, the beginnings of barely any diplomacy scholarship. So I just said to him, oh, I'm a big fan of your work. And he said, oh, really? And I said, well, let's just say you, sir, are my Beyonce. And he, and, he, and he was like, oh, that's quite the compliment. And then we ended up chatting for, like, an hour, and we, we've, stayed, we've stayed in touch. But so I say this. Uh, about soft power backed by his voice and my conversations with him on it. So that's why. So um, wonderful conceptualization on, on soft power, but exactly as you said, uh, you know, ask, ask your question. Um, the, the ability of soft power to erode and to erode public opinion is, is quick. Okay. Mm-hmm. But the ability for it, for that public opinion to actually have as much pressure as is needed to change any foreign policy or domestic um, policy objectives and aims, uh, the the road is long. Exactly as you said in, in Vietnam, and you know we see this, uh, you know, in Gaza, and and it's not you know not just just Gaza. You know, we're seeing it, uh, you know, in numerous countries around the world. That you know, it's almost shocking that the entire world can be screaming at their their 
politicians. Like out in there are millions, there are thousands, depending on uh, you, the, you, their, uh, the numbers in their nation state. And the, the, the government still doesn't change, like mm-hmm. still does not change their policy. And so it is a long, long road with the erosion of soft power. Now, there can be regarding the internal erosion. What, what, by that, I mean the, the national people of the country um, going against the core aims and, and policies of the government eroding that. Now, the eroding of soft power um globally comes very fast right this has been got quite a quite a quick downfall for 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 the us and a and, and an even faster one for israel for for mm-hmm. no one who knew about it before um and you know i really don't one of my big irks is that when people comment and and say things like well you know you know so, some people comment and say oh i i'm just hearing about this now but you know i'm supporting palestine and someone comments under you should have known about this before i'm like no no like it's one of my i like i have you know to use that word the privilege but i have the privilege to be able this is my job right this is my job to to understand and learn about this like my like my family who are not into this have you know, have to go out every day to, to work, nine to five jobs, put food on the table. You know, some people do not have the time, you know, like, OK, regarding now, everyone knows about gas, but I'm talking about beforehand. Right. Not everyone has the time and the luxury to be able to, you know, know all this when they're trying to just feed their families and put the river table. So it's very, very uh, it's just it's a, a very, very important that we do not take down people when they are now. Uh, because of social media and um, they've learned about this they're learning about it understanding with palestine that we immediately respond you should have known about this you know 20, like yeah maybe you should have but like we don't know people's lives you know um and they're doing the best we can so it just that yeah that's a, another i do go on the tangents but um i um that but yeah to to, to tie it back actually just to finalize that the 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 fall of soft power globally can be very, very fast, uh, like we're seeing with Israel and and the US because of social media. Like, mm-hmm. and it, it and it wasn't fast before before that, even with mass media and the introduction of twenty four hour news. Um, but it, and it can also um, rise extremely fast. Like we saw the example with Japan mm-hmm. recently. Like, oh, oh, there was one that was one hotel, and everyone's like, "I'm off to Japan." Like. <laughs> Um, you know whether they do that or not. That strategic narrative that's 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 put around uh, social media and, and that kind of nation branding as well, which is linked to soft power, is uh, you know wonderful uh, for for a country. You know, I think an interesting case study um, in the, the the rapid rise of soft power. I mean, uh, there's also some elements of hard in, in this example, but the Houthis coming out of nowhere yeah. and becoming a global player. Um, I I knew a lot of, I I had some contacts in Yemen who were straight up like who these are terrorist organization. When they took over sauna, they murdered uh, so many people. And now in the the course of six months, they're like, you know what? These guys aren't so bad. Um, uh, And and also um, they're in a geo strategic location that allows them to be a massive inconvenience to the rest of the world. And that in conjunction with a cause that a lot of people support, which is just for a ceasefire because they've, they've said they'll stop, you know, um, attacking ships. Once a ceasefire is called Hezbollah saying the same thing in the North Hezbollah. Also, I I know some Syrians who really hated Hezbollah because of what they did during the civil war, uh, Syrian civil war. Now they're kind of changing their opinions. Uh, So, the, the rise, the the shift in soft power between like the West and what the West considers these terrorist organizations has been really interesting to watch. Yeah, and, and partic- and again, all all, all uh, fueled and, and um, you know uh, brought out brought out by social media. We would have you know we would have never um, we would would have never known this. And you know the uh, one reason you can get behind that, I think, is uh, no, my belief is that. You know what is happening. What we are seeing is horrific. Doesn't even cover it like that. Where I can't even find words. I don't think humans should have words for what's going on. You know, after um, 
the Holocaust with the Nuremberg tribunals, like the crimes against humanity were created, uh, the, the, the wording, then we had crime of aggression, you know, words were invented, then genocide, words were invented for things that should never have existed. Just like we're seeing that we should not have words for this. But what we what we're, we're seeing now when people are working together, you know, whoever they may be, for the, as I said, the most basic level of l letting people live. Like that is, you know, it is the most basic level and, and it's truly shocking, you know, we're preaching probably to the choir here with, with, with listeners, but it's just truly shocking that no one could get, be that, that someone could not get behind that concept where it's like, okay, we're just for the saving of innocent lives. And the spin, we could go, that could be a whole other episode, but the spin and the propaganda and, um, and you know, the, just the use of, of, yeah, all everything of what I always mentioned about Hannah Arendt's work, um, you know, by the Israeli state, it's just, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah, but if we're talking about digital diplomacy, I mean, yeah. my background's more in like military and like military intelligence stuff. We, we call yeah. that like, uh, information operations. Yeah, and the, yeah. th the thing is, Israeli information operations and the information operations of the state um, expressed through like Hasbara and, and paid social media influences on hmm. Twitter or Instagram yeah, yeah. or TikTok. It's been very unsophisticated, but somehow yeah. it's still been very effective in keeping people on board, you know, with obfuscating narratives like Israel has the right to defend itself. Uh, they use human shields. And uh, uh, you, what, what's so strange to me is like watching the veteran community when I was thinking about this. It's like they, they start saying th these, these narratives too. Like it's effective with them, which it shouldn't be because there's like Hamas doesn't fight in uniforms. It's like, dude, I deployed four times with you. We never once fought a person <laughs> who was in uniform. Why is this argument working now? Why, why does yeah. it work with Israel? It didn't work with us when we were part of a coalition task force during the unfortunately named global war on terror. So um, yeah. I'm just wondering, like, uh, from a digital diplomacy standpoint, like, how does how does that fly? Well, is it well, fundamentally stupid? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I couldn't agree more. But the, even, yeah, they, you know, I, I know you're saying there that they have, you know, it's somewhat unsophisticated yeah it's unsophisticated perhaps in its perhaps the the what we see is the narratives mm -hmm. you know being played out however now much to my, my my shame but I have been in the Israeli foreign ministry I have this is when I was like uh, living in Palestine when I was working um on on my on my PhD and so I've also seen you know and just as you mentioned that uh, in universities, they pay uh, students twenty dollars or you know uh, equivalent an hour, uh, and this was two thousand fourteen when one of the the it was deemed a conflict um, that, that that I was working on, uh, but they did this as continuous, so twenty dollars an hour to um, after after their lectures whatever go into the computer room and simply just engage like with with commentaries like keep exactly as you're saying, keeping these narratives out going. And so it's not bots, it's not, these are actual people, you know, working, mm. get, getting paid. Quite a sophisticated, and that's just, that is just like one piece of, of the, the, the whole puzzle. Um, it is quite a sophisticated operation regarding digital diplomacy. It's not, if, if, if not the top, it's like one of the, the if it's the second best in the world when it comes to like digital diplomacy um, and 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 uh, strategy. Uh, but, it, you know, why why these narratives work? Um, so that is less to do with um, the actual uh, dissemination of them and the the as I said the payment of people or kind of the, the the tools that's more just to do with our human psychology so that's why I always go back to Hannah Arendt sorry I butcher her second name I'm awful Ash um, yeah. the the Irish are not good I can say that collectively Ash uh, we try to be good at Gaelic our own language try uh, but we're not good at most other languages um, apologies to those Irish who very much are but I'm not um, but Hannah Arendt A R E N D N T so, uh, she, you know, she was, for, uh, for those who may not know, she was a political scientist um, who escaped Nazi Germany 
uh, during the war and uh, went to the US and became one of the greatest, in my opinion, political scientists of all time. Uh, she wrote The Origins of Totalitarianism, a very worthy book to read, The Banality of Evil. And she actually um, uh, was one of the people who um, created the foundational concepts for the Nuremberg Tribunal. So uh, this is different because I worked myself on the Khmer Rouge Tribunals where we only tried five people. Um, so the five leaders, but Hannah, Hannah Arendt said, um, no, no, like you can't just try the top officials of, of, of the SS. Everyone needs to be tried because the person on the train, and this is where, this is what I believe if the, if we get to the ICC tribunal, okay. Uh, this is, I, I fully believe in, this is how it should be run. If the person on the train knew where that train was going, they are responsible. If the person driving the train knew where the train was going to, they are responsible. So yes, you can always have these kind of psychotic, I don't even want to call them psychotic because that lets them away with something. These You can always have these kind of, um, you know, top leaders doing, committing these horrendous crimes, but you need the bureaucratization of evil, you, she called it. You need all these cogs in the machine, which is exactly what we're seeing in, in Israel, because without that happening, this, this could not take place. You need everyone in order. And so I hope in, in, in the ICC, uh, if, it, if it comes to trial, that that is the foundation and not the Khmer Rouge um, that, that we're going to see. But again, another tangent, as you can see, I'm queen of tangents. But one of the comments that she said, and this is about information narrative, she said, the ideal subject, she, wrote, she said this, can you imagine, not even just reflecting on it, like during her escape, it's just phenomenal how anyone could analyze this one, this beautifully during the time it's happening, she said, quote, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced communist or the ardent Nazi, but the person for whom fact and fiction and truth and falsehood no longer exist, end mm. quote. And, you know, that is fake news before the term fake news was called. It's so because social media and disinformation has created such a world where we question everything, it is not the people on the hard left or hard right, we want to call it, it's the people in the middle where there's no distinction now between fact and fiction and truth and falsehood. That is where the Israeli propaganda machine comes into play. It's putting the doubt in their mind and then people don't know what to stand up for. Um, and, you know, another quote that she says is, you know, uh, it is far easier to act than, the, than to, t to think in times of war, you know. Um, and so because she says, if you be, if you literally begin to think and analyze what's going on, then you will automatically see the absurdity of what is happening and the truth will be revealed. So it's getting people not to think about things, just putting narratives out there, keeping them going like the same ones all the time and we may think it's absurd going oh come on think of something new but if they keep coming at you people don't you know they they have an inability to think and analyze they just take it in so um yeah her works and, and this explains so much of it but um i know that was a roundabout way of answering the question but i think it's a worthy um foray no, I mean, I, I remember coming across that quote when I when I first studied uh, started studying international relations. Yeah, it's not the hardened communist or the convinced Nazi or whatever it was. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's the person in the, in the middle who doesn't. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, just in case you guys are listening to the audio, um, uh, Jennifer is calling in from a music studio. So there is uh, people. Oh, sorry, no, 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 no. Yeah. there are people practicing uh, violin in the background. No, but hey, it's it's not bad because you know violin can be rough if, if you're not an experienced player but that wasn't that wasn't bad so and i don't even know so, sorry uh so uh because i i started my degree in violin so mm -hmm. and my family are musicians so this is my sister's uh music school so all of this politics and diplomacy is a twist for everyone for, for me so that's why i'm in the things sorry about that <laughs> yeah no worries okay so um how uh, i i kind of wanted to see like that's like how is the collective west losing its soft power within because you brought up the within the context of its like institutions because that's yeah. one of our big selling points that we always yeah. talk about it's like the strength of our international institutions we oversee the un the icc the icj and and 
and it's kind of like imperialism. Uh, they're, they're extensions of imperialism used to like exert power and control outside yeah. of um, our own territorial territorial sphere of influence. But it's like yeah. we're, we're, we're at, a, at a stage of imperialism where it's not even we're not even exploiting. Uh, countries in the global south just for strictly economic aid. It's, it's like we're in a stage of imperialism where we're literally cannibalizing ourselves. So yeah. we, we, we're on, in order to defend Israel, in order to, which is like a vassal state, or it should be, uh, if, yeah. if power dynamics of empire were normal, which they're apparently not, um, mm -hmm. you know, for the sake of a vassal or a client state, we're, destroying these institutions which we use to project hegemony across the globe yeah. so and you know part of our soft power and hard power is like bound up in in you know the icc which you know um uh the chief prosecutor khan of the icc said a yeah. senior western official told him that wh why are you charging israelis you know the icc is meant for africa and thugs like putin and uh, the, the degradation of these in institutions, uh, what is the long-term consequence of this? Uh, an absolute, it, I, so there's, there's the theoretical long-term concept and then there's like, will it actually happen? So yeah, so what, what we have seen now, we've seen before, but again, what's, what's different here is that the whole world has seen it right on their screens. But what we see now is everyone knows how powerful and how much power those five permanent member states hold for let's talking with the UN in particular um, at the Security Council, you know, and I, I remember uh, in October, November, when, 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 when people were calling, when, when st the UN resolutions in General Assembly and, you know, I voted in them many times, people were saying, well, how on earth is there not a pause when we, the days we were talking about pauses, don't get me started, but like pauses or ceasefires. Um, and, you know, when 90 percent of the countries, let's say, would be voting for a pause, everyone was saying, well, surely that's it, you know. And so, um, no, then we began to learn that. Um, and I was like more than happy, like, um, you know, on Instagram to be always commenting back and trying to, you know, uh, explain and, and discuss this with people saying, no, the only thing legally binding in, in, in international law is a resolution passed by the UN Security Council. And it can only be passed by those five member states, which are the primarily the victors of World War Two. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is an old ar ar archaic um system already and you know i've sat many times in the general assembly and so there's you know you have head sorry violin goes again <laughs> many, many many times um you have the heads of state week and you every single head of state uh, gets up and all those top uh those those five officials of, of the permanent uh the p5 will say in their speech every year we need to revise the security council it's like a speech, they, uh, a paragraph they just put in. We need to revise it. You know, we need to revise the veto. So they acknowledge this and, it, you know, it, it, ne it never uh, happened. So the only thing legally binding in, in international law is passing the resolution, okay? But what we have also seen um, now is, one, the struggle to get a resolution even passed mm -hmm. because of the power of those five. So that, that's one key aspect that we know and you know, uh, you know, the watchers of, of, of politics or, the, or and diplomacy and those being in have been saying this, you know, for for decades. But two, what we're what the world is rightly seeing now is one of for me the key issue in all of this, along with the the P five, is is enforcement. Right? Mm -hmm. There is you can pass the resolution. It has been passed, you know, due to an, abs an abs uh, you know, uh, the U.S. abstaining, but it's, it's been, oh, sorry, Russia abstaining, but it's passed. Mm -hmm. But there, the U.N. does not have enforcement mechanisms to, to make their resolutions legally binding. The same is true for the judicial wing, which is the ICJ of, of the U.N. The key issue is they do not have enforcement mechanisms. The same with the ICC, they have small aspects of enforcement, but unless the, those people, if let's say arrest warrants come out, unless the, they're actually go to a country where they're arrested, um, they can't be. And the, this usually all works fine when we're dealing with, 
medium, small size states, actually pretty much every state mm -hmm. other than the P5, right? But if you have enough power, and this is where hard power comes in, doesn't matter if it's soft power, if you have enough economic might and military clout like the P5 do, mm -hmm. it, does, you, it doesn't matter. Even if uh, an arrest warrant comes out, you are, you're not going, you are not going to be arrested. Because another country is, even if you even if you entered the terrain of another country who signed up to the ICC, and they have, let's say, strong um, economic links with your country, they're not going to arrest you because that's going to ruin their ruin their economy. So these top, that's where hard power still comes out on on, on top. Mm -hmm. You know, these these top people can get these top, particularly the five, um, can get around. Uh, the enforcement issues, no problem. So enforcement is one of the key issues. It can be solved when countries don't have the power, soft power or hard power, you know, to put up a fight. But when the countries that we actually need <laughs> to stop committing mass murders or atrocities like we're seeing now, um, they, who have the power, the economic might and the military clout to do so, we can't enforce it. Um, and also the US has not signed up to the ICC, right? Um, and so, and it's also saying it's going to sanction uh, the ICC. So, yeah, we'll see about um, that. Yeah. So, I, I think um, when we, when it comes to co coercive force, also to enforce these ICC and ICJ decisions, um, there has to be a political will from the United exactly. States to do so. So, I wanted to just before we end, because I know you got a class, I just wanted to pull yeah. up an article from the LA times from 1993 um, that I, 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 I Yugoslavia. Just, no, this is Somalia. So okay. um, it, it, 1993, uh, if you guys don't know, it was popularized this, this short conflict uh, and the U S involvement was popularized in the movie, uh, black Hawk down. So mm -hmm. Adid's arrest is crucial. Uh, uh, Muhammad Farah Adid uh, was, uh, a Somali warlord. We're not going to get into the con uh, the thing, but uh, Adid's arrest is crucial to UN principle. War crimes, how the Somali is brought to justice will become precedent for international law. So when we say like these international institutions are made for, are, are made for Africa, this is kind of what we're talking about because mm. then a UN uh, peacekeeping, peacekeeping task force, which involved U S special operations forces like Delta and Ranger regiment uh, was mobilized to, uh, you know, basically find fix and detain Mo uh, Muhammad Farah Adid. So, there are in, it, it, the ICC and ICJ basically don't really have a lot of coercive force unless the United States wants Ex it to. Exactly. So yeah, it's at the um, and that's the you know that's the the, the 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 point I was making, saying the enforcement happens when you have everyone outside those with the greatest hard power. So it works on that. But when 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 you do not have the backing, you know, particularly of of, of the US. Um, no, it's it's not going to happen, and you know that is uh, not a place clearly today we want to 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 be in. And you know it's the enforcement mechanism there, you know, that or the lack of enforcement mechanism when you don't have those hard powers um, or kind of top global powers be behind you in the hard power sphere, you know, is is nowhere more kind of. Um, the, there's no no greater spotlight, you know, than than what we're seeing uh, today, which is, you know, just I, yeah, again horrendous. You, can, you can't even use words like horrendous, but um, you know the yeah. You know, I have no really, I have truly no words for for uh, how on earth they're going to get justice and 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 bring it. But you know, uh, I always say these are things that never thought possible in other circumstances mm -hmm. in, in the Khmer Rouge tribunals. Like I never thought that, uh, you know, uh, you know, speaking to all the people um, in, in the Khmer Rouge, uh, not in the Khmer Rouge, sorry, correction, <laughs> who have, who were uh, as families were taken and murdered by the Khmer Rouge. Uh, they said, look, we never thought we'd see a day when, 
we would have a trial, let alone convictions. So we got convictions of crime against humanity and genocide. And so, you know, hearing that and the court was packed. So every day, so every day from Phnom Penh, the, 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 the tribunals were like an hour outside and they, we would, uh, you know, the, um, go in, go into the bus. Um, and yeah, sorry, one moment, sorry. Um, the go into the bus and the uh, I was working for the European Diplomatic Service and as the ambassador rightly said he said like look these tribunals are for the people they are for the people to see justice yes we don't have it like the Nuremberg where everyone's being tried there's only five members but justice is being some justice is being shown and we never thought we'd see a day when when this happened when this would happen so even though I get quite down and, and worried about how on earth are we going to enforce this on states like, you know, the US and uh, on and Israel, because this is a, you know, a different game that no one has played regarding international law and enforcement. Look, law, international law uh, was, you know, is not guided, was not brought by a Bible, a Torah, you know, a Quran. It, this is man-made. It, it can grow with, it can evolve across from international law. And, you know, we can, uh, I just hope it will grow and change with what the reflections of the uh, what the people actually want. So I think I think it is possible. It's going to be a long road, uh, but uh, I certainly think we need to uh, believe in the courts while also recognizing its flaws and its issues. You know, both can be true at once. We don't have to hate the court and we don't have to uh, love the court. Uh, we can you know try and work work with it uh, to try and improve it and get justice some semblance of justice no true justice will ever be served for what is happening but yeah well thanks so i think you're uh you're out of time um yeah, thanks, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so much for uh coming on mm. this kind of like loose freeform uh conversation about soft versus hard power i guess the the main c conclusion is soft power the ability to co-opt rather than coerce is easily gained as we see with the Houthis and easily lost as we've seen with yeah. Israel. Uh, and it does take the loss of soft power and sustained loss of soft power to finally influence foreign policy and Definitely. the movers and shakers of hard power. So as I said, it's a marathon, just like the Vietnam yeah. backlash. It's not a sprint. So um, just wanted to say thank you so much for yeah, thank coming you. on. It's, it's been, I'm so glad we finally got to do it. And it's been an absolute joy. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I won't say joy regarding discussions. You know no. what I mean? A yeah. I mean, everything's a mess right now. So yeah. yeah. yeah so <laughs> on that note. <laughs> yeah. Um, Th thanks, Greg. All right, guys. Uh, thanks so much for listening. We hope to see you the next time. And we are out again. Thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer Cassidy. Links in the description. Bye-bye, y'all.